speaker is uh, uh, Charles Selenier. He will speak on bet sequences and feedback of data sheet bets. Good. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, you said first of all, uh, So when this, when this project started, the idea was to look into feedback with carry shift registers and see if uh, maybe there's a sort of more general break on stream ciphers that can use these. But after we sort of got into it, we, we realized that there was some more uh, stuff that we didn't know about the sequences generated by these. So it made more sense to sort of go in the analysis of those sequences rather than trying to break some things. So uh, first I'll dig, first I'll dive into an intro introduction to cryptography and then talk about stream ciphers and then get into what, what my project was on. Next slide. So this is just a general setup for any crypto system. So you have uh, two people, Alice and Bob. So Alice wants to send a message to Bob without uh, Eve being able to eavesdrop on the, uh, the communication. Uh, so, so what Alice does is uh, she has her plain text that she wants to send to Bob and she encrypts it with some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, crypto system and usually it's secured by a, an encryption key. So that's, that ideally you've, you've uh, said that um, up to so if, you're, so if your key is so many bits long, you have, uh, so since the key was 32 bits long, it would, so ideally it would take the attacker a brute force attack to get through your crypto system. You, sometimes that's not the case. Oftentimes it's not the case, since most crypto systems are eventually broken. Um, so anyway, so, so while it's, while it's uh, in the middle of the line going to Bob, uh, it's encrypted as ciphertext. So this is something that Eve shouldn't be able to read easily. And uh, then it's decrypted by Bob using either uh, the same encryption key in some places are a very similar one, or in, in other cases it could be something completely different. Um, but eventually uh, Bob recovers the plain text and figures out what uh, Alice had to say. So, so another important thing to remember is uh, Kirch Kirchhoff's principle, which is that uh, in assessing the security of a crypto system, one should always assume the enemy knows the method being used. So this is to say that um, Alice and Bob couldn't just come up with some obscure language that Eve can't read or something like that. So they're not relying on the fact that they could just pass it. They could pass uh, the plain text all the way across and Eve just can't read the plain text. Like, you, you can't depend on that. So it has to be encrypted because you have to assume that Eve sort of knows the language, knows, knows how to read the plain text, so we'll be able to recognize it if that's what, what's, being, what's going across. Um, and so since you know the whole algorithm, the security is entirely based on the encryption key. So first I'll just introduce uh, what XORing means before I get into my example. So, so in the uh, finite field of two element, elements, also known as the, the Galois field, size two, uh, you have the elements zero and one. And so when you add in this field, uh, if the elements uh, don't match, you get a one. If they do match, you get a zero. So move on to the next slide, please. All right, so, so this is how an encryption would work with a stream cipher using uh, the uh, finite field of size 2. So next slide, please. So you might have some plain text of lots of zeros and ones. And uh, a stream cipher, you'd have your key, which is another, another set of zeros and ones. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that everywhere that in the key that there was a 1, the plain text flips, uh, flips the bit. So each individual uh, element of the plain text we call a bit. And uh, it's just flipped into the ciphertext. So uh, it turns out that decrypting is actually the exact same key. So if you go to the next slide, uh, decryption, the ciphertext, you just flip to the top, is the exact same key, and you get the plain text out. So next slide. So the question is why would we use stream ciphers? So if you know a little bit about crypt cryptography, there's block ciphers and stream ciphers. That's generally how you can sort of partition different crypto systems. Uh, block ciphers, you encrypt like a whole block of things at one time. And sort of the most secure block cipher today is AES. But problems with AES is it's not very quick. You have to, there's lots of hardware involved that you need in order to encrypt using that, that system. So, uh, and also the, the plain text, the plain text length is not always known. It's not, you know, maybe, maybe this, maybe you're going to be sending a plain text for a few hours or something, maybe in a transmission. And so you don't have, you don't want to be encrypting blocks at a time. You shouldn't be encrypting things as it's coming out. So maybe the stream cipher is running. Uh, right alongside the message that you're transmitting. And also it has uh, stream ciphers. Uh, we're looking to have uh, near one-time pad security. So a one-time pad would mean that uh, every that the likelihood of the, if the next bit in the stream cipher being a one or a zero, is, it's equally likely. And so that um, it's impossible for an attacker who knows only the 
a ciphertext to decide what the plain text is because the probability is that it could be literally anything. So, uh, so now so to uh, approach uh, one-time path security of the stream cipher, the idea is to use pseudo-random sequences of ones and zeros. <coughs> Um, so if you have so if you have any sort of algorithm that is going to produce ones and zeros, you can't really call it random because there is a way that they're being produced. So we call them pseudo-random, and uh, there's three properties that uh, this uh, uh, I guess Professor Gallone or Dr. Gallone uh, sort of decided in I guess the '60s that these were three things that uh, pseudo-random sequences needed. So the first is a uniform distribution. So there's an equal number of zeros and ones in the sequence, and this is within each period of the sequence. Um, so there's uh, 1 over 2 to the i of the runs have length i, so, so I'll have an example uh, after this, but that would mean that you'd have half of the runs are length 1, so you have sort of 1, 0, 1, 1, and then it flips to the next one, a quarter of the runs are length 2, an eighth of the runs are length 3, you know, that sort of thing. And then it also has low autocorrelation, so that means there's not, there's no relationship between uh, the bits inside of a period, so it's not that the every third bit is the same, or every fourth bit is the same, or every fourth bit is different, or that sort of, so that, so that's not, that doesn't happen very often, so, next slide. So here's an example, so up, up top we have uh, what would be considered a pseudo-random sequence that satisfies all of the uh, randomness properties. Uh, you can see that this is a link seven, so it has an equal number, it has, so two, it has two runs of length, uh, of length one it has one run of length two, and then another run of length three, and it also has low autocorrelation. Uh, you can see that there's also four ones and three zeros, so they're about even. <coughs> but it turns out that uh, this sequence is the period of this particular um, this particular uh, machine. And so this so what this is called is a linear feedback shift register, and uh, it's what many people will use. So you use shift registers to make stream ciphers. It's sort of the simplest way to make biggest stream cipher uh, that people use in their algorithms. And so it turns out that uh, this, this particular machine produces this pseudo-random sequence uh, with period seven over and over again. So next slide. And so this is sort of the, the general linear feedback shift register. So in a linear feedback shift register, you have the, you have the, main, you have the main register, which is where the X's are. And then we have the, what I call the taps, um, which are where the circles are. And those, those go in and you sum them using uh, the XORs as we discussed before, and then that determines what the next bit will be. So if you just follow the arrows, uh, you just sort of shift across, and every, everything in this everything in this uh, shift register is ones and zeros. So so all the X's would be ones, and the Q's would be zeros, and uh, you would you sort of multiply the uh, sort of multiply the X's and Q's. So if the Q so if QN was a was a one, and uh, X zero was a one, then that would add one to the sum. If they were different, it would add nothing to the sum. Uh, move from there. <clears throat> so what I studied were so lots of things are known about linear feedback shift register. There, this is sort of the first example, one of the first examples given by Gloom back in his book in the 60s. Uh, this is a, a new design uh, that people have come up with, I guess, in the past few decades, uh, called a feedback with carry shift register. So instead of instead of um, everything just summing to the next bit, you have this sort of memory that stores what may have been lost from the addition that was happening. So if if instead of having addition modulo two, we have uh, integer addition, we can store uh, what was left over, and that's so that's what that's what we call the carry. So you're sort of carrying the value of the previous the previous uh, addition into the next addition. So, so, uh, so what I'm going to discuss is the uh, so how we can uh, analyze the output of these feedback with carry shift registers uh, using two attic integers, uh, boolean functions, and then you, those two combined into uh, result that we found in uh, bed sequences. Excellent. So, uh, you may not be familiar with what two attic integers are, so I'll give you sort of a brief rundown on these things. We're not using too many facts in the two attic integers, but we are using the basic definitions. So, an infinite sequence of uh, zeros and ones could be interpreted as a two attic integer. So, um, so this is the formal definition of uh, two attic integers. I don't want to bore you too much with it, but um, essentially, uh, what I had written up there was a was sort of the digit representation of a two attic integer, and that would be the uh, coefficients of a infinite power series. And so, uh, the the all you have to have is 
So I can go to the next slide, please. It's, uh, so each element in the sequence, uh, which is a two-attic integer, must be equal to, congruent to one before it, modulo the power of two that you're on. And so, as you can see, the sequence before what I had was just, it was just alternating ones and zeros. And uh, it should be easy to see from this example that each of these is um, congruent to the one, ab one above it, modulo two to the i, based on what level you're on. And uh, all the ones and zeros match. Uh, we, call this, we call this form the, uh, the canonical form of a two-attic integer. It's, I mean, it's conceivable that you could have uh, two, two different sequences that are sort of equivalent. They, they have the same congruences going on as you move along. But in general, in general it doesn't really matter. You, it's, all you want to look at are the, the canonical form. So, so here's some examples of what the, uh, some two attic integers. So just a general one, alpha. You can, have, you can have the ones and zeros however you want. So this is just digit representation. And the digit representation guarantees that you have that uh, congruence going on because you just got to insert the coefficients into uh, the sequence that I had before. Uh, so every every whole number uh, or natural number would be uh, you just sort of go up until you've defined that number sort of in binary and then you just put zeros after that infinitely zeros and then for rational numbers uh, for any rational number you have a, a, a periodic sequence uh, happening in the in the two attic integers. Uh, it turns out that for so for one third, you see that it's eventually period. So it's actually eventually periodic. So for one third, you see it starts off on the one, and then it gets onto the, the periodicity. For the negative one third, you have periodicity to begin with, and, then, and that that periodicity occurs, um, you know, if and only if the um, what's in the numerator is less than what's in the denominator, and it's and it has a minus sign in front of it. And so anything anything uh, before anything other than that, you're just essentially adding on to another sort of another rational number or maybe another whole number to your um, yeah, to your rational that you're trying to show the two atoms. Next slide. So uh, one of the sort of measurements you can do on these numbers is a two attic valuation. And so you're looking at uh, how many zeros was it until uh, I got to a one. And so so this is what you can use to sort of uh, get an idea of the uh, the it's called the the p attic metric. You can do this with any prime number but the where two is Two could be substituted with a prime. This is all, all, all of what I said before is true. Uh, I'm just kidding. It's going to be the two out of case. But uh, I'll use this later on when I'm talking about the bent sequences, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so this is an example. Uh, this is a feedback with carry shift register that's going to produce the sequence uh, minus 4 over 5. So um, as I said before, there's, there's lots of stuff that's known about uh, linear feedback shift registers. It is, it is known how to sort of make uh, any periodic sequence you want from feedback with carry shift registers, you can generally do that fairly easily. Um, based on the initial state of a register, so where the taps are, the circles and the squares, uh, if I know what those are, I can tell you exactly what the rational number is that it's going to produce, so we know how to do that. <coughs> um, whenever you have any, whenever you have anything in the, uh, the memory block, if you have any initial memory, that's equivalent to just adding on a uh, rational number to the uh, the number that would have been produced without memory. So it doesn't it doesn't sort of overcomplicate things. However, if you have lots of memory, um, it may take a while for it to get down to zero. And that's another theorem as well is that um, these this does become eventually periodic regardless of what the memory is to begin with. The memory will eventually lie between zero and well zero and p in this case is zero and it'll eventually get down to zero at once. Looks like. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about the Boolean function. So I gave you the table for the XORing, the addition, and GF2, uh, the Galois field of size 2. Uh, so, so there's the XORs, there's the ANDs. I did use the ANDs earlier. I apologize for that. With the, with, in the, uh, the LFSR, you had the, the Xs multiplying by the Qs. But as you can see, uh, it's the AND operation. So it's only one when they're the same. It's always zero when they're different. Uh, so just a quick example. Uh, so you can have uh, sort of vectors in GF2, so you have or GF2 to the end. And so that's a vector space. Uh, you can have vectors like A and B, you add them together. Uh, you know, just, uh, I guess you add them together uh, component-wise, and then A dot B, so uh, that should be uh, sort of a, a dot product. So, it is, so the notation's a little off there, but the, uh, you can do dot products. So. 
Uh, so now it's about Boolean functions. So Boolean functions are any function that goes from GF2 to the end to GF2. So, uh, so these, so what you would call, uh, so I think if you go to the next slide. Uh, so this is, so with Boolean functions, you usually want to know, okay, what's the truth table of this Boolean function? By truth table, I mean, where is it zero, where is it one for all of the input factors? So this is a this is a quick example of a Boolean function where you just uh, you just XOR the two the two inputs. So as you can see, that's <coughs> that's actually the exact same table as, as you would have for the, the XORing operation. Uh, you can imagine uh, so this would be a linear Boolean function. Uh, you can imagine having ands in there as well. Anything if you're ever anding two bits, then you're going to have some nonlinear term in there that's going to complicate things. <coughs> so so by so with that. With a non-linear term, uh, weird things start happening. We're not able to figure. We're not not able to say so much about what the Boolean functions are. And to get to get a measurement of that, uh, we use the Walsh transform. But before introducing that, I'll go into the characters of of GF2 to the end to uh, move into what the Walsh transform is and sort of what that means for us. So, uh, so a character of a. So I'll just read this straight from. So a character of character chi of a finite abelian group G is a group homomorphism from G into the multiplicative group of complex numbers. So uh, for us, uh, that's just a fancy way of saying that uh, for every chi, there's a, a vector associated with it in GF2 to the n. And when you input things into, into chi, which, which is, we're going to have as a function, you do minus 1 to the, to the uh, whatever vector it was, so lambda dotted with the input. So next slide. And it turns out that that's, uh, if you look at the the group of all the characters in GF2 to the n, it's actually a dual group, so it's isomorphic to the original group, um, where you're, you're essentially mapping uh, each vector in GF2 to the n to its uh, chi sub lambda, the, the character uh, GF2 to the n hat, as they have written there. So, next slide. Uh, so, so the Walsh transform is actually defined on pseudo Boolean functions, and uh, by pseudo Boolean, I just mean take, take the value of the original truth table and uh, Put that in the exponent of minus one. So, uh, so here you have uh, the same the same truth table as before with the f that I defined. And you're just doing minus one to the whatever is whatever f was. So, uh, whatever it's zero, it's one. Whatever it's one, it's minus one. So next slide. <coughs> so the Walsh transform is uh, written here. So if you want to take the Walsh transform of f, uh, you do its pseudo Boolean function times uh, times the times a particular chi sub lambda that you want to look at. And you sum up all those for all the vectors x and gf2 to the n. Uh, so what you get with the Walsh transforms for each function, you can get each Boolean function, you can get a Walsh spectrum of that function. And that essentially, the Walsh spectrum is uh, the Fourier coefficients of that function. And here we're doing discrete Fourier transforms, not continuous Fourier transforms. <coughs> so next slide. And uh, from the from the Walsh transform, so if we call uh, so. So here we can see that we can write each pseudo Boolean function as a linear combination of the characters in GF2 to the n hat. So of the characters of GF2 to, GF2 to the n. Uh, so that's where, so we have this sort of normalization coefficient in the front of the, the summation. And each C of lambda is just uh, a normalized uh, Walsh uh, transform. So a normalized Fourier coefficient, essentially. And actually, Sorry, uh, the uh, a normalized uh, Walsh transform at that lambda c of lambda is what we would call the the Fourier coefficients. In, di in different papers, you may in different papers you may have uh, some people normalize this, some people don't. Uh, it really doesn't make much of a difference. It just depends on what you're doing, and, and in some sense, how much uh, how many fractions you want to write in front of what you're writing. So, um, so the uh, so a bit function uh, is what what we've been uh, particularly concerned with. Uh, we got in touch with Professor Gorski at uh, Princeton University, who's been doing work with uh, Professor Clapper on, uh, on these uh, feedback with carry shift registers. They've been looking at algebraic feedback shift registers. And one of the questions he sort of posed to me was, uh, what, what, uh, what is the 2x span of, and I haven't defined 2x span, but the 2x span of uh, feedback with carry shift registers that uh, go through uh, M sequences and produce uh, these or sort of these sort of bent sequences. And so, before we we're able to get into what exactly that question me meant, uh, we know what M sequences are. So I'll briefly describe that. An M sequence is where you have a feedback with carry shift register that goes through all the possible states in the main register. 
and so it so its period is maximal in a sense. It doesn't it, it only repeats when it has to. Um, so for a bed sequence, uh, I guess for a bed sequence, what we want to have is you so you have a bed function and you want to you have a particular boolean function and you want to sort of filter off that state of an M sequence so you sort of go through the whole truth table and get a whole sequence. But I'll, I'll go into that. So a bed function is where you have all the Fourier, for, Fourier coefficients uh, being uh, plus or minus ones. Uh, and this, this uh, means that the F is perfectly nonlinear. So it's as nonlinear as you could possibly get it to be. Um, so if you go, uh, if you go back a few slides to the Walsh transform. Right, so, so if you look at the uh, chi sub, the chi sub lambda x and the uh, f hat of x, uh, both of those, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I don't have a display for this, but uh, it's going to be minus 1 to the f of x plus uh, lambda dot x, you can imagine that. And so you're, you're taking, you're raising minus 1 to the original function and you're adding on a linear function. And so you're getting a measurement of how close that function is to that linear function. And so when you get plus and minus 1s, uh, you're, you're saying that, that your function was as far away as it could be from every linear function in the space. So, yeah. So, so the reason why bed functions are, are nice for us is because they they exhibit all of the properties that uh, they go all of Gollum's sort of random randomness postulates. So the first one was that they needed to be uh, sort of have a uniform uh, distribution, and so there was. So the ones and zeros were about even, and that's true. So you have two to the n minus one, plus or minus uh, two to the n over two minus one once. And so when, when n is large, that's I mean that's that's nearly half. So next, um, so it's perfectly nonlinear. So with linear functions, with linear boolean functions, you sort of get this block structure in your truth table. Uh, that doesn't happen with uh, with, uh, with the uh, bed functions, uh, and, that, and that's and that's in line with. The, the sort of runs that we were talking about before. And about for every bed function, this discrete derivative is zero. It's always zero. And so that's for low autocorrelations. So, so uh, as I was uh, sort of mentioning before, uh, you can take a feedback with carry shift register, and instead of taking the output on the right side and just you just throw those bits, bits away and sort of filter off whatever the state is at the current time. And so. So, with a bed, so if f was a bed function and the feedback with carry shift register uh, uh, sort of it produced an m sequence, so it went through all the possible states, uh, you can imagine that f would uh, sort of reach all of its possible values going through, with, with a shift register going through its whole period. So, next slide. So, instead of, so m sequences, uh, I'm sure you can imagine the states aren't going to go in any particular order, and we haven't done much work on that. And, that would certainly complicate things. So we decided to look at uh, what are the, so what if we had a lexicographical order of the M sequence? So call this a lexicographical Boolean sequence. And so you just, con just consider the truth table just term by term would be coming out. Uh, so uh, we'll call it minimal period being sort of the, the smallest period and the smallest period that a sequence would have. Uh, and so for bed functions, uh, you get that the period has to be the entire truth table. So there is no periodicity of a truth table in a bent function. And, this, and that's in line with the, the autocorrelation that I was discussing before. So, uh, so, so I'm so, sort of going to the, the theorem, the result that we were talking about. Uh, so with the, so we'll call the two attic expansion of F, sort of considering that that truth table before is the coefficient, so the, the digit representation of a two attic number. And uh, so for this, and then, and then the result involves a particular uh, bent function, bent, bent function uh, the Marana McFarland class of function. So every, every function in this class uh, looks like this, um, and they're all bent. So the function is, you take the first half of the variables in the, in the function, and you do a dot product with the second half of the variables scrambled in any way you like, and you can add on any Boolean function g. And uh, that, that turns out to always be bent. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, and so this is, this is sort of the, the result that we, that we proved. And it's that the, the, two attic, uh, the two attic valuation of, of that, uh, the two attic expansion of that, uh, or any McFarland construction, construction 
is entirely dependent on the permutation that was used to make that, uh, that uh, function in the class. So, and that's all I have. So, any questions? Okay, thanks. Well, I guess, I guess as I mentioned before, like I said, we haven't considered M sequences. We haven't considered uh, sequencing the uh, the function differently. So, if you go back to the go back to the filter, come back to the page shift register. Uh, so this is where you sort of, I guess, I would like to go from here. Yeah, sure. uh, so this, so this was, uh, if this produced an M sequence and it went through all the states, they're not going to necessarily go in order. And so, so, so my, so my result doesn't doesn't really apply to. I mean, it had to apply to a very particular uh, feedback with carry shift register. I'm not even sure which one, uh, where the M, where the M sequence, where the states are in some kind of weird order, and then the two attic valuation uh, comes out to be a little different. So. so I actually do have a question. I don't sure. know what's the M sequence. Uh, so the M sequence. Uh, so maybe if. Let's go back to Yeah, go all the way back to the the linear feedback. So almost the linear feedback. Oh, okay. So I'm doing a few Let's go to the next one. Okay. So, so the so the state in the register is where all these boxes are, and you can look at a you can maybe say that's uh, that's a binary number, right? And so there's there's two cubed possible states of this uh, this linear feedback shift register. And so, if this produced an M sequence, it would mean that uh, it goes through all its possible states as it's giving the sequence. So, so an M sequence would mean that the period is maximal coming out of this register. So, so. the other question I had was, you had this notion of zero random. I got lost. What is the connection between those three properties you had and the M function? Does it produce good pseudo random numbers? Uh, yes, I mean it's. I mean that's the idea. If you had a if you have a bent sequence, then it doesn't. You don't have this autocorrelation happening. You don't. Uh, you don't have this. Uh, the, the runs are going to be nice. Like we were going before, and then also, you know, we that should be. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't fit the uniform distribution exactly because uh, that was supposed to be it was supposed to be off by one. But as I said before, as you get to very large, and I mean, we're talking about it's. I mean, it's nearly half. Nearly half of the, the true table is going to be ones. It's very close. So. Okay. Is this actually the probability in a random sequence of zeros and ones in your form that uh, these are the probabilities of having one value? Um, I mean, yes. If, 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 you, if, you have, if you have a sequence and they're independent, zero, one, say 50 50, mm -hmm. then this is the probability of a run of one time? Uh, essentially, yes. So you're going to have, so if you have a sequence of length uh, 16, uh, you're going to have uh, eight, you're going to have eight runs of length one. So you might have, uh, so you might have a run of two, a run of one. So you have like two ones, a zero, a one, zero, one, maybe a couple. So I guess it's, so if you go to the, so, so we call a run sort of uh, a bunch of zeros in a row or a bunch of ones in a row. And so, so here we have a, a length seven. Uh, so we would expect about I guess it would be three or four. Maybe my example is not quite correct, but the uh, uh, so we have so we have a, so we have a run we have one run of one, uh, another run, zero. another run of uh, zero, and then we have one run of three and one run of two. And so uh, probably in a pseudo random sequence, you would you would expect. So half the runs, so you'd have uh, three. So you should have three runs of ones or zeros, and then uh, you should have so a fourth of seven, about one, one to two. So one run of twos, and then uh, and then below an eighth of seven doesn't really make much sense. But to fill it in, you get a one run of threes. Do you have a reference for that? A reference. Can I fill? A probability result. 
uh, for the... I thought the formula was much harder, so I'm going to use the Okay, well, I mean, what I'm referring to is not... I'll, 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 I'll look at it. Okay, yeah, not specifically a probability. That's just sort of defining how many runs you have to have at that length. So. Any other questions?